Well, it seems you've reached the end of your trip. Welcome to the final part of Paleo Rewind 2021, a series of videos put together by Edge and other content creators covering some of the year's biggest discoveries in the world of paleontology. This year, I have the pleasure of presenting to you some of the findings from December 1st all the way up to today. I I'm really hoping they don't find definite proof hexapodal dragons once roamed the earth within the hour of this video's publication. If you haven't already, be sure to check the previous episodes in this series, including November's creators, The Budget Museum and Dane Pavitt. A link to their videos in the description. Additionally, a full video with everybody's contributions will be released on Edge's channel tomorrow, January 1st. If this date is in the past for you, you can find a link to that video in the description as well. If this date is in the distant future, please contact your local doctor and scientist to discuss how you may be suffering from a time travel experiment gone wrong. And without further ado, let's begin! Thyrophora are a group of Ornithischian dinosaurs that lived during the early Jurassic period until the end of the Cretaceous, featuring dinosaurs such as the Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus. The newest member of this family is Stegoros elegasin. This dinosaur's near-complete skeleton was found in subantarctic Chile, and just like other armored dinosaurs, it had a tail weapon. While the Stegosaurus has a pair of spikes and the Ankylosaurus has a tail club, Elengasin had a flat, frond-like structure with seven pairs of laterally projecting osteoderms encasing the bottom half of the tail. The animal itself was relatively small, only being about 2 meters in length, and had a body like a stegosaurus. Its skull, on the other hand, closely resembled the armor appearance of an ankylosaur. So, which is it? A stegosaur or an ankylosaur? The answer? Neither. After extensive research into similar species, it was found Ellen Gasson was closest related to the Cunbarosaurus from Australia and the Antarctopelta from... Well, use your imagination. Yep, that's right. It was found in... Cleveland. What the f going on, Carter? Only in Cleveland, South. Just kidding, it was actually Antarctica. In fact, after Ellen Gasson's discovery, the three were moved into a new clade altogether known as Parankylosauria, which are characterized by their small size and stegosaur body and ankylosaur head combination. While we can be 100% sure its tail was used as a weapon, well, let's just say you don't want to be on the receiving end from a hit from it. Open the door, get on the floor, our next story has us walking with the dinosaurs. Pop culture often depicts dinosaurs like the T-Rex running after people, only for them to catch up and make a tasty primate snack out of them. What they didn't tell you is this was not scientifically accurate. Shocker, I know. In reality, it's believed T-Rexes could not even actually run, and clocked in at a max speed of 12 miles per hour. In fact, most dinosaurs did not run at all, or at least preferred not to if given the choice. While 12 miles per hour is certainly fast enough to get most people, if you're Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world with a top speed of 27 miles per hour, you shouldn't have any fears of one of these ancient creatures catching up to you. Until now. La Rioja, Spain is famous for its dinosaur footprints, many of which have been found here in the past. The location's most recent discoveries from sites La Torre 6A and La Torre 6B, however, set a new record in the world of paleontology. On December 13th, two sets of tracks, 6A14 and 6B1 were discovered, being comprised of 5 and 4 footprints respectively. Even though we don't have any remains of what actually left these prints, we can still learn about a lot from their creators by observing the prints themselves. We'll go into appearance in a bit, but let's focus on the locomotion of the creature first. There are two important things to focus on when considering how the creature moved. First is the length of the footprint, as this can be used to calculate the animal's hip height, which in turn can provide insight into how much force the creature was using to move in the first place, and second is the space between the footprints, as this determines the stride of the animal. Iconologists were able to determine the dinosaur's prints were cast at angles suggesting the dinosaur was full on running. Quite the rarity in the world of paleontology, as it is believed dinosaurs often preferred not to run, if they could at all. Of all the recorded footprints at the site, 96% come from walking dinosaurs, a little under 4% come from jogging dinosaurs, and only these two sets come from running dinosaurs. What are they running for? Did someone set off dino mite? <laughs> little baby scared about a little bit of extinction? Anyways, how fast were these dinosaurs? Well, it's estimated 6B1 ran anywhere from 14.5 miles per hour to 23.04 miles per hour, and 6A14's printed at 19.68 to 27.738 miles per hour. 
To put that speed into perspective, on the low end, this puts it within the top 3, and on the high end, makes it the top dinosaur speed of all time uncontested, making it the fastest non-avian dinosaur of all time. So, speed's great and all, but what kind of dinosaur is it? Well, for the sake of time and simplicity, let's assume a single species made both sets of footprints. The print reveals that the host was a tridactyl, was functionally mesozonic, meaning the animal's weight is supported by the middle digit, had a wider foot versus a longer one, and had present feathers. This combination of traits suggests that the maker was certainly a non-avian theropod, so looking at what theropod fossils we have found in Spain, the top candidates are Valley Bonaventrix cani from the Spinosaurus genus, Concavenator corcovantis from the Carchartinosaurids, and Camariosaurus sergwidae from the Ceratosaurian theropods. While it's impossible to know for certain which of these species created these prints, you wouldn't want to look back anyways if you were running for your life. Before we begin this segment, do me a favor real quick and think of a bird. What features of said bird do you think about initially? Maybe the feather colors? Maybe it has an interesting beak shape? Perhaps the song it produces? No matter what it may be, for 97.8% of you, I doubt you consider the tongue. Rightfully so. For most species, the tongue has rarely anything notable about it. In fact, I'm sure some of you didn't even know birds had tongues. This is far from the case for Brevirus duravis macrohyodus. I'm sure that's how you pronounce it. Recently discovered in the Geofiting Formation in the Liaoning Province, China, an avian fossil belonging to the Cretaceous period depicts a small bird within the Enantiothornis clade. The fossil itself is incredibly preserved, depicting two features of focus, an elongated hyoid bone and stunted cranial rostrum, otherwise known as a short beak. The hyoid bone is a small U-shaped bone that sits just above where the Adam's apple would be located. For humans, this bone's appearance is relatively insignificant. However, for certain birds, it will literally wrap around the skull, almost cupping it like a loving mother's embrace. Macrohyoid... Okay, okay, okay. From now on, I'm gonna give some of these harder to pronounce names a little bit of a nickname to give myself an easier time. So for the time being, this one's name I'm going to call... Gene. Gene shares this elongated hyoid shape, suggesting this is the earliest recorded case of a bird being able to stick its tongue out of its mouth. Uh, now I do realize that was a hell of a claim to make, just because it has a funny bone. So what evidence do I have to support this claim? Well, first of all, because I said so. And second, because as I mentioned, some birds today share this feature. Those being the woodpeckers, the honey creepers, and the hummingbirds. And just look at these freaks of nature. What's even freakier is how this bone ties into their abnormally long tongues. The tongue needs to be stored somewhere, and that somewhere happens to be the inside of the bone. That's right. Our winged friends pull the tongue back into their mouth, it wraps around the skull, and sits just below a pocket where the right nostril would be. Considering Jean has a similar bone, we can assume their tongue was similar as well. Now, what purpose could this tongue actually serve? A pretty useful one, actually. Just as modern birds do, it likely used the tongue for feeding purposes, either using it to hunt insects, drink nectar from a flower, a combination of both, or something entirely different, we can almost be certain that it evolved this trait for the feeding benefits it provided. This suggests the bird may have been a branch between early stem birds and the extant birds with this feature of today. Dinosaurs weren't the only paleo discoveries made this month. 326 million years ago during the Carboniferous period, an extraordinarily large millipede, known as Arthropleura, roamed the forests of Howick Bay in Northumberland, England. I will elect to nickname this specimen as Arthur. Found within a cracked cliffside, the fossil was originally discovered back in January of 2018. The true magnitude of this fossil wasn't realized until just a few days ago, however. Several body segments of the animal were well preserved and able to be studied, but were missing a full image of the creature, including the head. Despite this, one segment is all we need to get a rough estimate of its total size. Using the beautiful and trusty principles of worm math, we have observed that nearly every species of myriapod are 4.78 times longer than they are wide. Arthur's segments were approximately 1.8 feet wide, so using this formula, we estimate the total length of the animal was a whopping 8.6 feet, making it the largest known land invertebrate ever discovered. This species has held the title for over a decade now, thanks to a pair of fossils discovered in Germany, though these crawlers only came in at just over 5 feet in length. Of the three, Arthur is clearly the largest by a massive margin, 
and is believed to be an example of gigantism in the species, making Arthur the uncontested largest individual of the category. Arthur Pleura was believed to inhabit wooded coastlines, so they likely ate vegetation or smaller invertebrae, which is all of them. So, all in all, it seems Arthur is really the largest of all millipedes. Or is he? Based on the proportion of the body that was fossilized, we can only see 20 legs present. Now, of course it has more than 20 legs, but using more worm math, scientists estimate Arthur only had 32 to 64 legs total. The suffix milli suggests 1,000, so to be a true millipede, we're missing over 90% of the required leggage. In fact, no myriapod, extant or extinct, or otherwise, has ever had anywhere close to 1,000 legs, meaning, in a literal sense, the millipede does not exist, never has been, and never will. Merry f Christmas. At least, that was the case until earlier this month. Welcome to a bonus story. Around the same time Arthur's story was published, 1,000 miles away in Western Australia, 200 feet underground, the discovery of the first ever true millipede was made. Eumillipes persephone is a living species of myriapod that is represented by four individuals, all discovered at the same time. One of these individuals had 13,006 legs, beating out the previous record holder, Elacme planipis, by nearly 500. While I'd love to continue discussing this animal, this is Paleo Rewind, so let's get back to dinosaurs. While it is widely believed that many modern-day birds' ancestral roots lies with the dinosaurs, who are the ancestors of the dinosaurs? For the Velociraptor, the answer is... More dinosaurs! Meet Vectiraptor greeneye, an ancient species of dromaeosaur from over 125 million years ago. I will refer to this individual as... Vector. Vector was originally discovered in 2004, but most of its remains were left undiscovered, and to this day, Vector is still only represented by a few spinal vertebrae and part of its sacrum. It remained in paleontologist Mick Green's private collection until recently, when a joint study by the universities of Bath and Portsmouth revealed that they belonged to a completely new species. They compared the vertebrae to other dromaeosaurs and revealed many similarities, allowing them to group the new animal within the family. Vector is much larger and stronger than the Velociraptor, believed to be about 10 feet long. It was covered in feathers, had massive talons on its feet, and had serrated teeth. Using this weapon combo, it likely hunted prey using an ambush strategy, possibly by climbing trees and pouncing like leopards, which it needed to rely on considering how slow it was. It wasn't a top predator in the ecosystem, but it was fully capable of taking down prey of similar, and even slightly larger sizes. While on the topic of its ecosystem, Vector was found in the Wessex Formation and the Isle of Wight, New England. This is extremely important, because even though a large range of dinosaur fossils have been found in the Isle of Wight, never have we found a dromaeosaur before. Previously, these dinos were exclusive to other parts of the world, such as North America and Mongolia, so finding not only a dromaeosaur, but an ancient dromaeosaur suggests the family may have originated from this area. The study then claims they were able to cross over into other continents while they were all closer together via land bridges and oceanic dispersals. This would fit as the Isle of Wight is believed to be a crossroads between Asia and America for other species of dinosaurs during the Cretaceous, so this idea is far from far-fetched. No matter the case, we welcome Vector to the family nonetheless. Imagine, you're a late Cretaceous baby dinosaur a day away from meeting the planet we call Earth. You spent a long couple of weeks developing within your egg. Certainly a harrowing process. You've managed to get lucky enough to not be eaten by a predator. Then the worst catastrophe of the area wipes out your entire species in an instant. But, millions of years later, you get a second chance at life. As a clickbait article title on the internet, this is the case for baby Yingliang, an oviraptor embryo in ovo discovered in the Heiko Formation in southern China. Yingliang was found in a nest alongside their unborn siblings and parents but this little one appears to be in the best condition overall. There's been a lot of information about this little guy on the internet, so let me clear up something first. When paleontologists say Yingliang appears as if it died yesterday, this does not mean DNA is still intact. So no, I'm sorry. We're not on the cusp of Jurassic Park yet. However, Yingliang still does offer some exciting insight. Laid nearly 70 million years ago, the embryo is in extremely well condition, 
showcasing a complete skeleton of the animal. It lies within an elongate two-lithid egg, and appears to be 11 inches long. We can see its head lies between its legs in the tucking position, which is a posture previously unrecognized in non-avian dinosaurs. This is a position that's common in late-stage modern bird embryos. This suggests that pre-hatched non-avian theropods had similar hatching behaviors to modern birds. Some birds are born with an egg tooth on their beak, which they can use to crack out of their shell. The tucking position adds further mobility to allow this cracking behavior to be executed easier for the bird. The tucking process takes a few days to occur, and based on Ying Liang's positioning, they were equivalent to a bird's position on day 17 of its 21-day cycle, which is where the headline comes from. All known oviraptor species had a beak, so considering the tucking behavior, it's likely this animal did this for the exact same reason birds do, possibly being the link for this position altogether. And finally, we come to the last story. Cetaceans, the largest animal of the oceans. Being comprised of whales, dolphins, and other similar mammals, they've ruled the seas for all of human history. These animals weren't always at the top, however. Before them, similar reptilian animals, such as ichthyosaurs, filled their fundamental niche as the ocean's top predator. Even though they were some of the top predators, ichthyosaurs only averaged about 5 to 15 feet, depending on the species, so the beasts never grew to the absolute gigantic proportions seen by modern-day whales. That is, until a few days before Christmas. Recovered from the fossil hill member location in the Augusta Mountains of Nevada, a gigantic ichthyosaur was unearthed for the first time. This monster was named Symbospondylus youngorum, after Tom and Bonda Young, who created an ichthyosaurus branded beer. As such, I will be nicknaming this specimen, Tom. Initially, we only found some of Tom's vertebrae, but further excavating unearthed the animal's massive 2 meter long skull. Even more digging found more backbone vertebrae, shoulder bones, and forefin bones, estimating the creature's full size to be about 17 meters, or 56 feet for my American viewers. Tom is believed to be nearly 242 million years old, and may have been the apex predator of its environment during the Triassic epoch. Aside from being the largest animal ever discovered from this period, its large eyes were likely used to see prey at deep depths, and its large, conical teeth were likely used to hunt fish and squids. A few fun facts about the ichthyosaurs in general, they're not actually dinosaurs. They're classified as marine reptiles, which is the same case for other animals such as the plesiosaur and mosasaurus. You may have noticed, aside from size, how many similarities Tom shares to whales and dolphins. Since both don't have gills, they must return to the surface to breathe, which is where they both originated from. For cetaceans, their ancestor was the Pachycetus, a quadruped ungulate that looked a lot like a crocodile otter abomination. And as for ichthyosaurs, while we don't have the exact link, marine reptiles also evolved from a land-dwelling counterpart. It is important to emphasize that these similarities arise independent from one another, however. They don't share an ancestor or anything, so scientists have used Tom's gigantification from earlier ichthyosaurs to explore the evolution of whales and their growth towards their massive size as well. Tom's growth came relatively early on in their evolution, appearing just 2.5 million years after the first ichthyosaur showed up. Whales, on the other hand, took much longer to reach their size. Two things are believed to contribute to this rapid growth. One is the Permian-Triassic extinction, where 70% of vertebrae went extinct. This opened the seas to a large amount of prey, with few predators, which led directly to the second contribution. Ammonite squids and similar creatures survived the extinction, which happens to be the perfect prey for the ichthyosaur's serrated teeth. Now if we compare these principles to the whale story, yeah, they fit. Whales emerged shortly after the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, and looking at sperm whales, the closest living animal to Tom in terms of size, also happen to have teeth similar to Tom which happens to also be perfect for their prey, which also happens to be squids. As such, scientists believe predators with the perfect biological weapon to hunt whatever just survived a mass extinction is what leads to this gigantification phenomenon. And that's a wrap on Paleo Rewind 2021. I hope you enjoyed! If you'd like to see the rest of the episodes, check out each creator in the description below. And if you enjoyed my lovely personality and narration, consider subscribing! If the interest is there, I'll certainly cover more Paleo videos in the future. Remember to check the completed Paleo Rewind on Edge's channel tomorrow, and continue to explore the Biodiverse.